Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on carpooling, car sharing, and more. Um, so my name is Jennifer McGowan. I work for Smart Commute here at the City of Toronto, and our program is um, supporting employees across Toronto to improve their commutes to work and be able to commute more sustainably. Um, this webinar today is part of our Smart Commute Month activities, and if you haven't already, uh, please fill out our Smart Commute survey and join our challenge to try a new a sustainable mode this month. Um, we have lots of great prizes to be won, and we also have some information and support um, that we can send to you uh, to help support you moving towards a new mode or helping your colleagues to do so as well. Um, so today our presenter is Adrienne from Smart Commute, and she'll be working um, or helping us work through this uh, presentation today. And if you have questions throughout, we encourage you to use the chat function, as I mentioned earlier, so those new to joining. Um, if you look in the top right corner, you'll see a chat icon. If you click that, it will open up a panel in your bottom right corner uh, where you can chat and uh, type messages. If you want to send a question to Adrienne, please pick all all panelists in the send to uh, drop down menu and we'll make sure to monitor that throughout the meeting so uh, we'll be starting very shortly um, we'll just, uh, wait maybe one more minute for people to get logged in and we'll get going from there uh, so we look forward to presenting this today and again if you have any questions please feel free to, to ask throughout through the chat function thanks all right well thanks so much Jen for that great introduction uh, as said, my name is Adrian Boyd and I work uh, in Smart Community. You might recognize my name from some emails and that sort of thing. So today we're going to be talking about carpooling, car sharing, and more. And really helping you uh, make carpooling work for you, help you get started with carpooling, as well as talking about some really exciting stuff in terms of carpooling and car sharing and the future of travel. So let's get started. Today we're actually going to be covering um, a, few, a few key points. So the first uh, section that we'll be going over is our carpooling basics. So what is carpooling, carpooling in Toronto, and some of the benefits of carpooling. Second portion is going to be about how to get started, so practical tips for you to find your carpool and also how to make it work for you, so giving you some do's and don'ts with carpooling and its etiquette. Then the final section of our presentation is going to look into the future of carpooling. Um, so this is some really exciting stuff that I just thought uh, you'd be interested in. There's uh, current things that uh, we're working on as well as um, future future technologies that we're, we're looking towards. Um, so we'll cover that at the end, which is uh, going to be a bit of fun. So what is carpooling? So carpooling is really using your personal vehicle to share the ride with one or more people. So um, using a private vehicle or a shuttle or something like that, that's not really carpooling. There are other things called van pooling that uh, use private cars, but really carpooling is on the individual level. You sharing the ride with someone else. And who carpool? So it could be coworkers, it could be classmates, friends, strangers, um, babies count, <laughs> uh, but mannequins do not count. Your dog does not count. Uh, I'm always surprised at how people say, I have to drive my dog around, we're carpooling. Uh, sometimes we get the question, is Uber carpooling? Um, and I just want to highlight right off the bat that yes, they are sharing the ride with someone. There's two people in the car. However, Uber is often a, uh, a paid driver. Um, they don't know where they're going, so they're not really sharing a ride that they're already taking. They're more like a taxi in that they're choosing to drive you somewhere else. So it's certainly a good option for not having to use your own personal car, uh, but it isn't really carpooling. So today we're talking about carpooling. Carpooling is part of Smart Commute Month. It's very exciting. And uh, James Corden, you know, you've seen on, on TV, carpooling is, is great. He's getting all kinds of stars into his car. It's really hot right now, right? And carpooling is something that has sort of come in and out of popularity many times in recent history uh, since the car has been invented. So we're going to take a little bit of a look through sort of the modern history of sharing the ride and how that's changed through uh, the decades. So the first time that we really saw large-scale carpooling um, was during wartime. So there was wartime conservation really uh, organized through government agencies where you would basically go up to your local government office and say, I want to share my car or I want to ride in someone else's car, and they would actually match you one-to-one. -one. Um, really, they, they did this in an effort to conserve uh, gasoline uh, all towards the war effort. So it was, it was a resource conservation measure. A little bit later on, uh, through the 60s and 70s, the U.S. and Canada saw a huge increase in the number of vehicles on the road and also experienced a major energy crisis. So gas prices were skyrocketing. 
Uh, we also started seeing some effects of traffic congestion and air pollution on a larger scale. Um, so it was really economical for drivers to get as, as much out of every last drop as, as possible. Um, so not only did commuters take notice because of the high cost of driving, the U.S. government also stepped in and officially started studying how to conserve gas as a part of the Department of Energy, and Canada did likewise. So we, we got serious about conserving gas, tracking that conservation, and trying to find ways to get more out of it. So this is still seen today. They still publish things like the fuel efficiency rating for cars, and they continue to promote carpooling. Just to give you a sense of timeline, so 1969 was the first time that carpool lanes were implemented in the U.S. And uh, in 1977, the census showed about 21% of American workers carpooled. That's just one in five. Uh, by 1980, it was still around 19%. So it really was a very popular way of getting to work. Um, it's less seen today, but it was not that long ago that people were sharing the ride every day as part of normal life. So into the 90s, uh, you know, carpooling declined slightly, traffic congestion and air pollution continued to be growing issues. Traffic congestion also started to be a major issue that employers faced. So this is when the earliest versions of programs like Smart Commute started to emerge. They wanted to help their workers, their commuters, find better options and provide proper support. I also just wanted to point out that there's a really great carpool uh, movie with Tom Arnold uh, called Carpool. It's on YouTube, 100%. Uh, you could watch it there. And um, it's, it's a very interesting take on carpooling. But it was sort of still part of the public sphere and the conversation um, and so forth. So as far as today, we experience even worse, worse traffic congestion and concerns over air quality. Uh, so we've come to realize that this affects our economy as well. You know, it's, it's important to have people move around to go shopping, go to work, deliver goods. Uh, this is really critical. We need to be able to move around. Um, however, we can't really build our way out of the congestion that we're experiencing these days. We simply run out of space. So the GTHA is projected to grow by about 3.8 million people in the next 25 years. Uh, so in conjunction with working on providing alternative options to driving alone, so things like developing transit, developing walking and cycling strategies, we can also try and move more people on the road space that we already have. So carpooling is central to that in terms of growth and continuing uh, good mobility in the GTHA. So, you know, carpooling is both good for sort of that large, greater good uh, sense of easing traffic and improving air quality, but you can also be selfish and want to carpool as well, saving money on gas and maintenance, um, as well as being able to save a lot of time as well. So let's take a look at that saving money aspect. So some of the benefits of carpooling, the first and foremost is saving money. This is something that you can calculate on the Smart Commute website, um, smartcommute.ca slash carpooling slash carpool savings calculator. It's at the bottom of that slide there. Uh, there's major benefits for people who carpool. So I, I plugged in just some of my average commute information. Uh, you can see here my gas price. This was the gas price, I think, last week. Um, my fuel economy is not great, but pretty average for North American vehicles. And I plugged in an average distance, so about 20 kilometers, let's say. Uh, so each each month I'd be saving $42, and over the course of a year, that's 500 bucks. Um, so I'm not saying what you should do uh, with your money and how you want to spend it, uh, but wouldn't it be great to put that cash into something other than the banal chore of getting to work and, and having to pay for it uh, to that degree? So carpooling is certainly something that you can calculate for yourself and understand how, how much you could be saving, uh, but you could also be saving some time as well. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how do you save time by going around and picking people up? Uh, but I just want to point out to you where the existing HOV lanes are, as well as the planned expanded network. Uh, so looking at this map here uh, on the left, so this is the near future expansion. You can actually see here in red is existing HOV lanes, so encouraging people to move um, through carpooling faster, more efficiently. It's both uh, to help people be encouraged to, to carpool, but also move those carpoolers faster. So where you can see in red there, that is existing. The orange on the left is uh, near expansion. So I was just going to point out here, the 401 between Milton and Mississauga, that orange piece, that was just announced this year that they're actually moving forward. So that's going to be 
a whopping 10 lanes wide. Um, and they're also providing general use lanes as well with that. Um, so after, you know, expanding to 10 lanes and having HOV lanes and having extra general use lanes, you really don't have much more room to expand any further. So that's going to be sort of it, um, being able to expand that piece of, of roadway. Um, on the right, this is just interesting, and I thought you would might find it interesting. So the future of these HOV lanes into the distant future, so 2013 or 2030, sorry, um, you can actually see how these HOV lanes continue to grow and continue to create a network where you can move through the entire GTHA through those HOV lanes. So this is something that's not confirmed. This is something that was proposed to the province as a long-term plan. So it's not in place yet, as I just mentioned, that, that small piece between Milton and Mississauga, that's something that's being confirmed. Um, but you can kind of see the distance uh, that we're talking about in terms of HOV lane expansion. So the future of driving really is carpooling, and it's how we're going to be expanding our capacity long after we run out of physical road space. I also just wanted to point out here, not only can you save time and money, you can also do so quite conveniently. So the province has provided um, a host of uh, Ministry of Transportation, MTO, uh, carpool lots. So these are carpool lots that you can find um, online on the MTO website. Um, or 511.ca, and it actually has the map here of where all these lots are located. They're always going to be next to a highway, so even if, you know, your carpool partner is not your next door neighbor, perhaps you're coming from two different uh, directions, but you're going to the same on-ramp, you could meet your carpool partner at the highway, no detour needed. So that's how you can also furthermore save time is meeting your carpool partner at these lots and then riding together, maybe using those HOV lanes. So this is a great alternative uh, if you weren't sure of someone who's, you know, your right next door neighbor. Another benefit that I just wanted to highlight here is getting a reserve GO spot. So at all GO train stations or almost all GO train stations now, um, there's a lot of, uh, carpool parking spots, so most GO train stations have some sort of carpool parking near the platform, so it's a convenient space that you can go. Um, when I was taking the GO train, you know, I would, ooh, I would watch, um, I would watch people sprint across the, the parking lot uh, to catch the train, right? So parking way, way far back and having to tread through potentially the snow or, uh, or the heat um, to try and catch that train. So. Uh, the great thing about these carpool lots is that about 90% of GO riders are within a five-minute drive of someone else catching the same train. So these are based on surveys that GO Transit has done of the people who use these, these stations. Um, so you can really save a lot of time by carpooling and using these spaces. Now, the way that you do that, and I've just put the URL at the bottom here, um, it's gotransit.ca slash carpool. You register together online. You really just put your name and some contact information as well as your carpool partner's contact information. They will send you a tag in the mail that says this person has registered to carpool. When you are carpooling, you put that tag up in your car window and you get to use those reserved spaces, which is great. Um, let's say your carpool buddy can't make it that day. No worries, you take the tag down, you park normally. But it's really nice when you are sharing the ride and you can, you can have that reserved space. Um, just through the rush hour, which is great. So yeah, save the cardio uh, for the gym and park close to the, the platform instead. So perhaps at this point, you're completely sold on the idea of carpooling and you're excited about it, but the actual task of finding someone to carpool with sounds completely daunting. The number one remark that we get at Smart Commute, uh, no matter whether you're downtown or out in Hamilton or anywhere in between, uh, is that I would totally carpool, but no one lives near me. Now we know for the vast majority of commuters, this simply isn't true. Uh, you just can't see that there's tons of great carpool partners, potentially also wishing that they could split the cost and use those HOV lanes as well. And yes, you may live out in the middle of nowhere, but you could be picking someone up along the way. You know, remember those highway carpool lots? They can make things really convenient for you, where you might be coming from somewhere where perhaps you are all alone in the, in the country. Um, but picking some up along the way can also really have a great savings effect for you. So you, you're looking for a carpool partner, perhaps you, you've asked around your office, no luck, and you're thinking, I'm all out of luck. I, I, uh, I'm not going to be able to participate in Smart Commute Month, I'm not going to be able to participate in Carpool Week in February, um, and I, I'm going to have to spend a fortune driving alone to work. 
Well, fear not, we do actually have a wonderful tool in Smart Commute that solves this problem. So Smart Commute has this ride matching website called the Smart Commute Online Tool. If you're not familiar, this website can help you find carpool matches. It can also help you find some transit, walking, and cycling directions if you're ever considering doing any of those. Today, we're going to be going through as if we're looking for a carpool partner because uh, this is a carpooling webinar. Certainly, we encourage you to check out your other options as well. Um, but let's start here. So this, this website is explore.smartcommute.ca, and it's linked in a lot of our campaign materials as well. So you go to this website here, you see at the top right, A is your start, so you could actually plug in your home destination or your home origin, so that's where you're starting, and your B is your work location. And then you just hit let's go, and then this screen will come up, and so you can see the map page that it brings you to. So along the left here, you can see the options available. You can click on carpool, and it'll bring you to the best matches for your trip. So these results, you can even see uh, how far the driver would have to detour to pick up passengers, how long that would take. What I'm pointing out here is so uh, in, oh good, you can see my cursor. So here, so along the carpool section here, you can click on that. And um, it'll bring you up all these, these great options. So Diana, Ashlyn, Marilyn, all of these people are along the way. I've plugged in sort of an average um, uh, commute here. You can also see on the map function that there are a number of other potential matches that are along the way. So perhaps um, you reach out to one of these people and it doesn't work out. You can go back and pick along all these other folks. Um, so it gives you a long list that you can scroll through to see who is a good match potentially. Uh, so say, you know, we pick someone from this list and we say, you know what, this really works for us. This could really be great. So let's say we pick Andrew down the list here. So when you click on Andrew, what comes up is this information. So it actually shows you how far he would have to detour. That's that 2.0 kilometer, 18 minute detour. Um, what his preferences are, so whether he's interested in being the driver or being the passenger, as well as his schedule, uh, if he has a specific schedule that he's looking to carpool. And then there's two buttons that say details and connect. So the details is what's above, and the blue is connect, which means that you can reach out to him via email. So I just typed in here, hey, I'm looking for a carpool partner just on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, looks like we could be a good fit. So you could hit send on that, and that message goes straight to his inbox, and uh, he'll be able to see that in his inbox right away. Uh, you won't have to use any sort of, you know, extra website messaging platform or anything like that. Um, what he'll see is, is what's on the right there. So I sent one to myself just so you guys could see it, uh, where they include the message that the person sends as well as their information of where they're coming from. Uh, so all you would have to do is hit reply to that email message, and now you're emailing back and forth directly, and you can set up what days, where you'd like to pick up, perhaps you'd like to meet beforehand just to make sure everything could work. Um, very, very easy. So finding a match should be pretty straightforward. The nice thing is you can actually map it out and see if people are good candidates. Um, but perhaps, you know, you get to this map here, and none of these people seem to be a good fit. None of these people either... Uh, perhaps you reach out and you find they don't have the same schedule. Perhaps uh, you reach out and it seems like they, they take a different route. Not to worry. So you can post your own trip on the tool. Um, and really, it's, it's a very straightforward process where you go up to the top here, along the top where it has all your different matches listed out with their names. At that very top, it says log in slash sign up to share your A to B. So posting your trip means that you become one of these names on the list and people can find you. It's important to be able to post that, even if you think you might actually have a good carpool partner lined up. Putting your trip on the tool means that other people can find you, and this is the best way that we can start connecting carpools together. So maybe you carpool with one person, you could start carpooling with two. It's a great option. So sharing that, that trip is great. And I'm just going to show you what pops up when you do hit that share your A to B. So it's a small window that pops up, and it gives you your information along the top. You can see along the top here, I, I put an example uh, address here uh, in Oakville going to Etobicoke. And so it already pre-populates your A to B that you've already plugged in. Below that, it has commute interest. So it says carpool, and then you can select whether you want to be a driver or a passenger or both. And carpool notes. So in here, I added I only need to carpool on Mondays and Tuesdays for whatever reason that might be. 
At the bottom there, you can actually see additional options. So I prefer to commute with anyone, male or female. So you can pick from one of those three. You can also share this trip with either everyone, uh, including the public, anyone who's on the Smart Commute tool would be able to see it, or you could select just people in your network. So say you work at Pearson Airport, you could say, I just want to share my ride with people at Pearson Airport. Along the right side there, I would just point out there's some details here that are sort of optional, but they're helpful for when people are reviewing your, your profile. So you can actually show when you start and end work, as well as what days you're looking to carpool. So for carpools, that is what it is uh, that comes up when you sign up to post your carpool um, on the website, and that means everyone is able to see your carpool trip and contact you about sharing the ride, which is a great, great way of connecting with people. So you've posted your trip, perhaps someone has messaged you, maybe you found someone right off the bat, um, and you're thinking, okay, now I'm ready to carpool. Now it's gonna, we're gonna get started. What, what happens now, now that you've agreed to it? So we're gonna go through a few tips uh, just to help you get through the awkward uh, first meeting or first uh, trip that you're trying to plan. So some key takeaways for carpooling when you're just starting, really start it slow, so don't try uh, you know, five days a week all at once. Um, you know, try one to two days a week and see if that works. Choose those days where you're not running errands, you're not picking up the kids or, or doing any kind of, you know, crazy meetings after work or anything like that. Find those days that are very regular where you're just kind of going from home to work and back um, and choose those as your, your carpool days and start with those. Also something that you might want to include in that intro email is, you know, what are your radio preferences, your music, podcast, you know, get to know this person a little bit. Maybe you would meet up beforehand or, or have a phone call beforehand just to see, you know, if it would be a good fit. So things like this, little details, really make it a lot easier. Maybe you like to sit in silence. Maybe you want to sleep in the passenger seat. That's all fine. Um, and it's good to set those expectations ahead of time just so that it goes smoothly as possible. I would also point out that it's very important to have certain expectations set. So things like a late policy. Um, if you're gonna be late either getting out of bed or getting to uh, your carpool after work, there should be some sort of grace period. So some people say, you know, five to 10 minutes is their grace period and after that, they can find their own way home. Or, uh, you know, there's a 20 minute uh, grace period after work because of course you've carpooled together, um, but after that they really can't wait. Or, you know, a five minute, uh, period in the morning when, when it's really just trying to get out the door. So these kinds of things are, are important just to make sure that your time is respected uh, and others feel respected through that carpooling setup. Um, also something important is to establish some sort of driving schedule. So with carpooling, certainly some people could be drivers and some people could be passengers, uh, but a lot of people choose to switch it up. So they drive one week, you drive another, or they drive one day and you drive another, depending on what works for you. So maybe that one person really needs to have their car um, and they're happy to carpool with you, but they, they need the vehicle during the day. You know, so maybe that means that they're gonna be a driver many days of the week. Um, or, you know, maybe, you have uh, winter tires on your car already and, uh, and you're ready to go on, on those bad days. So maybe uh, you'll figure it out a long way, but it is important to establish some sort of expectation for the driving schedule to make sure that, again, people don't feel like they're being some sort of car service um, or that they're getting driven around. So once you've sort of established those, there's a few more do's and don'ts that you can kind of work through um, just to make sure that, you know, everyone feels that this is a good deal that they're getting out of it. So some carpooling do's uh, that you can remember. So text or call is a heads up. So, you know, beyond just meeting uh, and emailing back and forth, some sort of way of being able to reach out to people and say, hey, I'm gonna be late, or hey, I'm early, or hey, I'm in your driveway um, is really, going to make it a lot easier for you. Um, so being mobile is important. If you're a passenger, definitely help your driver clear it off snow and that sort of thing. Maybe you want to bring them a coffee once in a while just to show your appreciation. Things like that. You want to be kind to your driver. If you are a driver, keeping a full tank of gas is a really great option. Um, you don't want to be sort of nervously driving along, not sure if you're going to run out of gas or if you're going to have to try and find a gas station during your commute. Things like that, you want to take those bumps out of the road and, uh, and make things as smooth as possible. 
Also, as I mentioned before, you know, decide on what to listen to or if the passenger wants to sleep. So maybe, you know, earbuds are, are ideal because you guys are going to do your own thing. Uh, or maybe you find a, a great radio station. My colleagues and I carpool a lot, and we find that uh, we have one favorite radio station that neither of us likely listen to outside of the carpool, but it is our carpool radio station. We love it. It's the move. It's the move. It's great. Um, so that is something to consider, and it can be really fun. It can be making your carpool a really enjoyable part of your day. A lot of feedback that we get from our surveys on carpooling is that people actually enjoy that company quite a bit. I know it's, it's nerve-wracking to think, I don't, you know, I'm not sure if I want to share my personal space on the road, um, but really once you dive into it, people really like it a lot, and it, it ends up uh, giving them much higher satisfaction uh, with their commute. So don't be afraid to, to reach out and get to know your carpool partner. Um, and if you want to sleep, that's also okay. That They can respect that as well. I would just point out also some don'ts for carpooling. So these are uh, Hall of Fame bad carpooling moves uh, that you definitely don't want to do. So leaving garbage in the car, either as a passenger or as a driver. So as a driver, you certainly want to take a look over your car before you start carpooling and say, is anyone going to have to move stuff out of the way to sit down? That is definitely not respecting their space and not uh, giving a good first impression. You want to make sure that car doesn't have to be detailed or anything like that, but make sure that it's nice and clear of uh, garbage or, or other personal items. Maybe move it to the trunk at least. Um, if you're a driver, also uh, making sure that your passengers feel safe um, so not driving or speeding uh, or cursing other drivers, certainly being respectful of people on the road. You want everyone to feel good about uh, riding in your car and that you'll continue to maybe share driving privileges. Um, so that's, that's a, you know, a, just a golden rule in general, but it's also important for when you're riding with a carpool partner. I should also mention, uh, just with that first point, not leaving garbage in the car. So as a passenger as well, I have frequently been a driver where people have left things in my car. Co coffee cups is uh, often something that they just tend to forget. So as a passenger, just be really uh, conscious of anything that you're leaving in the car and make sure that you're taking those little things away because you certainly don't want your driver to be driving you places and then also cleaning up after you. And that goes uh, likewise with that messy food point. So messy food, I have seen passengers eating messy food. I've seen drivers eating messy food. It's not great for the car. Um, so I would leave that at home. Perhaps a granola bar. Even if you're a passenger, you could bring your, your driver a granola bar or something like that. That would be really sweet. Um, as a driver, I would just point out not running unexpected errands. So if you if you and your carpool partner know that you know you like to stop off at Tim's in the morning and that's great for you guys. You guys can hit Tim's together and that's that's a win. That's great. However, unexpected errands, so things like I forgot that I had to do this, I have to go pick this up, I'm sorry, and it's the day of that you're actually running these errands, that's a big no-no. So you don't want to be taking people's time uh, for granted and, and just driving around town. So certainly um, making it efficient but also uh, clean. And I would also just point out the number one rule of carpooling is do not be late. So try to be there or ready a couple minutes early um, just to make sure that when they arrive, everything goes really smoothly. That's, if there's only one takeaway from a carpooling don't, don't be late. Uh, it's really, really important. So that, that kind of runs through our do's and don'ts in general of um, best practices for carpooling and how you can really um, take advantage of, of the benefits um, and certainly, you know, if you had questions, we, we could uh, go over some now in, in terms of carpooling and calculating that sort of thing. The Smart Commute Calculator, I would just point out, uh, exists so that you can also calculate how much you would pay the driver or if the driver um, wishes to be paid. Smart Commute does not handle anything like that. That would be agreed upon between the two carpooling uh, partners. So if you're curious about, you know, uh, compensating a driver or if you wanted your passenger to compensate you, at least ballpark, um, certainly you could use that calculator that we looked at earlier and, um, and figure that out. When I was carpooling um, to campus, uh, I was often compensating my driver with home-cooked meals and coffee in the morning and she quite liked that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an amount, but it is sort of uh, building up that relationship and making sure that everyone feels that they are compensated and respected. So with that, uh, you know, you have these great tools um, to 
to, to run with and, and uh, great etiquette as far as making sure everyone's enjoying their carpool. Um, so we're just going to take a quick look at Smart Commute Month, right? I'll just remind everyone that the draw is, um, is happening uh, until October 6th. So, of course, if you're in this uh, webinar, you likely have already done the survey, but I'll remind you that the, the prizes are two $300 VRL vouchers that are getting raffled off, as well as our challenge. So the challenge um, is a draw for one of 15 $50 gift cards to the Bay, Canadian Tire, Mountain Equipment Co-op, um, some, some really great prizes that uh, by uh, trying this, challenging yourself to, to try a sustainable commute this month, um, or encouraging others to try a sustainable commute. Um, you know, we, we want to spread the love as far as uh, sustainable transportation. So we're, we're happy to, uh, to provide webinars to help you understand. Oh, okay, so we have a, we have a, a comment here and I'm happy to stop and, and talk a little bit about this. Um, so this person said they've, they've tried uh, the online tool um, and tried to search for carpool partners, but they haven't had too much luck in the West End, Mississauga, and going across the city to Scarborough. Yes, so that's, so uh, the question is around sort of expanding search, trying to find more uh, matches, and um, I can just encourage you, so on the tool, you can go and sign up and um, join different networks, um, and so those networks actually show um, who's available and that sort of thing, so it, it connects you with that. So at the City of Toronto, um, it might be because uh, they might have closed the network just to the City of Toronto network. Um, so you might want to actually expand that. So um, one way to do that is you go into, you sign in on your account, and then at the top right there's a drop-down bar with settings. You go into that and it actually says My Networks. And that page will bring you up uh, all the different networks. And you could you could join things like Smart Commute Mississauga Network because that's where you're coming from. You could join um, the Etobicoke and uh, Toronto networks because that's where you're passing through, as well as the Scarborough Network, which you're likely already on um, because uh, that's where you're arriving at. So all of those networks that you're actually passing through because you have such a long commute, uh, you could be joining those networks to see who else is, is uh, traveling in that area. So you might be able to not necessarily do a complete A to B carpool with them, but you would, might be able to pick them up along the way, drop them off along the way, and they could compensate you for that. Or, um, you know, you could, uh, you could find um, some other way of compensating. So, so I would encourage you to, to find that My Network section. Um, there's also a set of YouTube videos that walks through the website uh, piece by piece, including things like sign in and networks and that sort of thing. Um, and that is where I would, I would encourage you to, to go and check in on that. Um, certainly we'll be uh, posting the tool guide um, after this that we can share to show how you can uh, sign up and that sort of thing as well. So thank you. I, I appreciate questions and things like that. Um, you know, this is a webinar to help you. So we're here to, to support you with carpooling. Um, so thanks for that. So, so Smart Commute Month is a great time. Um, I'll just circle back to this for a moment. So Smart Commute Month is a great time for you to be trying these behaviors. So perhaps you drive alone, um, or maybe you've only carpooled a few times. This is a great time to try that out, um, see if it's, if it's reasonable, if you like it, um, and just really what it takes to do it, uh, to understand you know, the reality of, of carpooling for the first time. Um, and that, that's a great way of just sort of exploring those options, knowing that you have these backups. Um, and you know, perhaps it, it's a really is a, a much better commute for you. You, know, you, can, you can switch off driving, or you can skip driving in the snow or something like that. Carpooling can really be a great uh, benefit to you. So trying it this month is something that we really encourage uh, people. And of course, Best Commute JTO is October 5th, which is next week. Um, so we'll be celebrating across Toronto, and we'll be on Twitter as well uh, for that. I would also point out that there's another Smart Commute campaign that comes up. It's in February, Carpool Week. So, you know, you have taken this webinar, you understand the etiquette and the basics of finding a carpool partner, you try it out uh, this, this month, for Smart Commute Month. Well, you can keep up that good behavior, and we want to reward you for keeping up that great behavior. So long after Smart Commute Month ends, you still are saving money, saving time, uh, arriving more relaxed and stress-free. 
So Carpool Week is a great time for you to be celebrated for that great choice. And so we often have some sort of contest or uh, incentives uh, to be logging trips on that tool, on the Smart Commute Online tool. And then you can show, hey, you know, I'm still carpooling. This is great. This works for me. And um, and we're always celebrating that. So I'll just point out down here um, those uh, uh, those Twitter handles and hashtags, uh, they do also announce through there. So you could always follow Smart Commute to see when those campaigns are coming up. And of course, the Smart Commute TO Twitter handle is the Toronto specific uh, Twitter Smart Commute uh, account. So that's where we'll be posting things uh, for Carpool Week and, and all kinds of exciting Toronto updates for transportation. So I highly recommend you follow us um, on Twitter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the future of carpooling. I will leave time at the end uh, for questions, um, but I did want to talk a little bit about what what we might be expecting in the near future, in the distant future, um, of travel and getting around. So something that's emerging right now is dynamic ride sharing. This is something where you know you can open an app, uh, an app up on your phone, instantly find someone to share a ride with. Um, now this you know current uh, format of Uber uh, or other popular sort of ride hailing apps, uh, that's really more of a taxi service. Um, so as I mentioned uh, at the start of this presentation, things like Uber aren't really um, that sort of ride sharing necessarily. It's more ride hailing, um, just like a taxi. But I'm specifically talking about the emergence of instant or dynamic um, carpool ride sharing apps. So things like Waze Rider and Uber Pool, it's more so in the US right now. Um, but there are sort of testing in Toronto. It's not really there as far as that goes. And it's, you know, it's really a departure from traditional carpooling. So, you know, you're not planning ahead. You're not going to know who your carpool partners are. You're just going to order up a ride um, or offer up a ride and, and go and see what, what kind of comes out. So this is something, as I said, like, that's growing in the U.S. in large urban centers. Um, there's been some testing in the Toronto area. Uh, certainly, you know, it's not going to be for everyone. Being able to know your carpool partner or having a predictable way of getting to work, a lot of people see that as a big value uh, to them. They don't want to sort of not know where they're going to be picked up or who they're going to ride with. Um, but it's something that is coming to urban centers that um, seems to be picking up a bit of steam. So. That is something to keep an eye on as far as um, that technology. I'm also going to talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles as well. So autonomous vehicles or, or driver, driverless cars, um, they could completely change how we travel. Um, so we're just beginning to grasp how this could impact our cities, our commutes, um, our jobs. And one thing that we should be carefully considering is how society adopts this amazing technology, right? Because it, it could change everything for us. Uh, and really the question that we should be asking is, you know, yes, it's, it's great for safety and convenience, but is this going to make gridlock better or worse? And uh, it has the opportunity to make it much, much better or much, much worse. So in terms of the sharing economy and uh, ride sharing, um, there's also car sharing. So AV fleets is sort of the future of, of AV as far as we know in, in terms of um, transporting us more efficiently. Um, and this is really you know, a, a reality check on the growth of driverless cars. So if we leave it up to individuals to buy their own uh, autonomous vehicle, um, you know, we're still going to be making the same mistakes that we have right now in terms of gridlock. So millions of vehicles can be purchased. Um, here's an example here. Um, so 80% of trips by owners is sort of what's projected with autonomous vehicles. If they were um, ownership led, so if, if they were all private vehicles, 80% of trips would be by owner, the 20% would be, you know, family, friends, that sort of thing. 2.1 million vehicles would be on the road. Um, and it would all be driven sort of through the auto industry and commuters and that sort of thing. Um, but really, vehicles purchased by individuals will still be competing for that road space that can't continue to expand and keep pace with the growth of, of the population. Um, so this is a big concern as far as autonomous or driverless vehicles go, is making sure that we're being realistic about how this amazing technology should be should be used. And you know, we can hack more capacity out of our transportation network by making AV work for us. Um, so by adopting these cars for fleet vehicles, meaning 
you wouldn't own the car as an individual. You would merely subscribe to a service that would come and pick you up and drop you off. Um, you know, they could pick up a number of people along the way um, using real-time ride-sharing data and then drop you off and then people who are sharing the ride afterwards. Um, and then they could just start a new trip. So combining both the instant ride hailing apps and dynamic ride sharing apps that are that are emerging right now as a futuristic sort of uh, carpooling strategy, combining that with autonomous vehicles um, would mean that we would only need a fraction of the vehicles to move people around. And it would be much easier because you wouldn't have to um, plan out how to do that. Now, fleets could be uh, part of a service, a private service, it could be part of an employer service. Um, there's lots of questions there as far as into the future goes. Um, but certainly this issue of who will own these cars, who will have to buy these cars and foot the bill for these cars, that is something that a lot of transportation networks are looking towards and following very, very carefully. So think of, think of autonomous vehicles potentially as an Uber meets carpooling with an autonomous twist. And just to speak a little bit more about fleets and the sharing economy, because we're kind of talking a little bit about um, ride sharing with carpooling, uh, I figured this also makes a lot of sense to talk a little bit about car sharing. Um, so I wanted to include, you know, some information on car sharing services that already exist, um, and they can save you thousands of dollars a year. So I have a Zipcar membership, and I totally love it, and no, they don't pay me to say that. Um, Zipcar is just one of them. There's car to go there's enterprise car share, there's community car share. These are just examples of Toronto car share services that you can sign up and be a member of. And what that membership really gets you um, is a lot of flexibility. So you become a member for a modest amount. Um, mine is less than 50 bucks a year just to just to be a member. And then you rent your car by the hour. So it's very easy. I Yes, I, I pay $35 a year uh, to be a member, and I rent cars for about 10 bucks an hour uh, when I need it. And when I'm not using that vehicle, someone else can. Uh, I get to drive cars that I could never afford. So things like Priuses and BMWs and all these, you know, great cars are available. Um, so I often carpool with my coworkers, and using this car share, uh, it's nice because other car share members can actually share the drive as well. So I usually um, take a break on one way of the trip and, and my carpool partner will actually drive the other way. Um, so that car sharing service is really fantastic when you start getting enough people on it. Um, certainly Zipcar and, and Car2Go and that sort of thing, they do have a large membership base. It is very popular in, in Toronto. And they've also expanded out to things like GoTrain stations and that sort of thing. So you can take the GoTrain and then rent your Zipcar and go wherever you need to go outside of the core uh, where you might think that there might not be that kind of service. Um, so the, it's a great opportunity to not only share sort of the cost of the ride uh, by carpooling, but also share the cost of the vehicle by car sharing. And car sharing is a great option for people who only sort of sometimes need to use a personal vehicle. Um, and you keep, you keep your car because you think, you know, what if this or what if that or, you know, this sort of thing that comes up, you know, once or twice a week. Um, this is where this can really step in. Um, and this is also something really to watch uh, as autonomous vehicles become more common. You know, these car shares might actually be the first place that you start to find that kind of thing. I would actually just point out here, uh, what you're looking at uh, with this image is a small map of where I was making this, um, this presentation. So you can see me here, I'm a little smiley uh, pin on that map. And you can see the dozens of Zipcar uh, parking spaces that are around me. So that's downtown. But I would encourage you to take a look at um, those maps that are outside of downtown because they, they do have quite a wide network. At the bottom there, you can see um, I was looking to reserve it for, I think, just an hour. Um, so you can kind of see at the bottom there different cars that are available, that are near me, and how much they cost per hour. So some of them are, are fancier, and they cost a little bit more than $10 an hour, but there's always sort of budget options there as well. So you would go on uh, your website um, or a mobile app, and you could reserve it on the fly, which is really great. Um, and again, no maintenance cost for those kinds of cars. There's no fuel cost. They come with a fuel card. Um, there's no insurance cost. They insure you, which is amazing. So this is how you can save thousands of dollars um, is by, you know, not having your personal car where you have to pay for all of those things yourself, just subscribing to the service and using those cars when you need it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And the way that it works is um, you simply tap in your car, 
and uh, oh, oh, I'm missing a slide. Well, that's okay. Anyway, so um, really all you do is tap into your car, and the keys are inside, which is fantastic. So it's a very quick way of getting around. Um, I use it quite a bit, and it's quite reliable. So just to wrap up a little bit about what we've seen today, what we've talked about a little bit, um, so carpooling and car sharing. So the benefits really um, of sharing your ride is really that gas money. People really discount it and say that it's, you know, it's, it's just part of owning a car. People are quite complacent. And I would say you should challenge that because it really does add up over the year and over multiple years. You know, that could be thousands of dollars that could be going into an investment fund or a vacation or something like that. Um, so it really could be going to better things than just paying for gas to get you places. Um, there's also that GO train station parking. So a lot of people who work downtown in the downtown core, you know, maybe they're making the trip by GO train or they're considering that. Um, you could still carpool just to the GO train station and that's a huge win for you because you, you have the peace of mind of knowing that you have a, a space right up near the front. Um, as well as getting started, you know, I'm glad that we were able to kind of go through the Smart Commute Online tool, discuss that a little bit more in depth. Certainly check out the YouTube videos that exist on uh, online that have a full walkthrough of how to use it, how to sign up, what the network can mean and everything like that. We can link that in a follow-up email as well as well as going through some of those do's and don'ts. So I hope you remember at least some of those ones. The number one one, don't be late. Don't be late. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we can kind of talk a little bit about Smart Commute Month and Carpool Week and how you can continue that, uh, that behavior and how you can get more rewards for, for choosing a carpool. Um, and I hope you enjoyed some of the autonomous vehicle fleet discussion about the future of cities and how that is sort of shaping how we think about transportation into the future, as well as car sharing. Um, certainly, you can check out any number of um, services in Toronto. As I said, they are plentiful uh, in the Toronto region, um, even out into the suburbs. It's a great option, and it's uh, quite affordable as well. So I'll open it up to questions. Uh, Jen just opened it up there, and um, we could have uh, myself answer questions um, or, or Jen, uh, depending on, on the questions that we might get. So feel free to type in your questions into that chat window. Again, it's at the top right there. It has a little chat uh, icon with the word chat at the top, and uh, it'll pop up a little chat window that you can type it in. Make sure that it's uh, set to all panelists so that uh, everyone can see your, your question. Absolutely. All right, so we are going to get out of this presentation. And I'm just going to go to Explorer, because that is the default one. And um, I'm just going to go and type in explore.smartcommute.ca. Oh, and it pops up because we've been there recently. Great. So explore.smartcommute.ca, the load up here. And so if we were just starting out, let's say we have here, um, Craney Street. So say, you know, I'm typing in my home address. This is the example address I got. I hope that person who lives there doesn't mind. You'll actually see when it pops up, um, it'll have this check mark at the, at the side here. So that check mark means that the website knows that address and understands what you're talking about. You might type in something here, um, uh, Dixon and Islington, and it might not understand. It might come up, you know, if I, if I misspell this or something it might not come up with anything. And it'll say, you know, did you mean this? Or you might have to just type it in again. That's not a big deal, though. So you can type that in. And then all you hit is let's go. You don't even have to register right away. But this is, again, what I was showing on the presentation. So it comes up. It has all these examples here. Oh, look, there's our favorite guy, Andrew. He came up first. Um, so pretend, you know, uh, Andrew is not a good candidate. Um, maybe we already messaged him and he said, you know, I, I, uh, I carry my four dogs with me and I don't, I don't know if you like that. So you can hit that login, sign up to share. And so from here you can actually um, uh, sign up at the bottom here. So create an account and you can sign up. Um, so we can sign up with an email address, so first name. Adrian Boyd, I'm trying to think if I can uh, actually create a, a password with my existing email address. Um, 
yeah, so I'll I'll just go through here. Um, sure. So so you can see here though, it would be you know Adrian at Toronto.ca. I would give in my password, and then really you just plug in your home and work postal code, and then that will pre-populate your searches once you're signed in. So it will know where you're going to and from. And as I mentioned before, it does have privacy settings so that people don't actually see your actual home address. They don't see 233 McCraney Street. They just see, um, you know, McCraney and Sixth Line, which is approximately where you live. Um, they won't put it right on your house. So you do, you do enjoy some privacy with this tool until people finally sort of connect and say, do you want a carpool? Yes, do you want a carpool? That's when you actually connect and you can actually talk to folks. So the sign-up process is very, very straightforward. And this is, I just wanted to point out one more thing here when we sign up. So you can actually see this join and find networks. This is a little bit of what I was talking about earlier. Um, so when you click on this find and join networks, you can actually see here all of the networks that are publicly visible on the Smart Commute tool. So you can see here, it goes alphabetically, so it goes with numbers first, but as you scroll down, it goes to different ones. So you can see here there's Go train lot um, networks. If people are just going to the the Langstaff station uh, go lot or the Kitchener station go lot and they want to find a carpool partner, that is something that they could join to see other people who are going there. You can see down here, right? So Liberty Village, Lush, McMaster, Metrolinx, Moneris, all like that. So they go on and on, and you can join multiple. Let's see here. If I joined one one one. So you can see here, I've joined 111 Gordon Baker Road. It's down there. And then you can also go back and continue to select them. So that's a, it's a great way to get started and, and be signed up to relevant networks. You just have to scroll through to see which ones might apply to you. And of course, the Smart Commute uh, ones under S, those are general ones that you can join um, that allow you access to um, a bit more. So that's, yeah, uh, thanks for that question, and I'm glad we can kind of walk through it. You can see here those smart commute networks. So they're parent networks, and um, they allow you access to a lot of commuters who are just in the area in general. Great. Oh, sure, yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Ooh. Oh, yeah, so apart from... HOV lanes and carpool parking, is there any other incentives uh, given by government to encourage carpooling? Um, so, so certainly, uh, you know, government, it's very important for us as a region to, to adopt this kind of behavior because uh, it's the future of our, our transportation system that sort of uh, goes with it. Um, so the, the biggest benefits uh, that we've provided are, are what we listed today, so the carpool uh, parking and that sort of thing. Um, and then also, uh, you know, the incentives that we provide through these kinds of campaigns is certainly, you know, uh, the 15 different gift cards that we're raffling off and that kind of thing. We're hoping that that might entice you um, at least to try it. Um, and then, of course, it rewards itself through savings in gas and time uh, and reserve parking and that sort of thing. So we hope that those, those things are, are good incentives. And, of course, Carpool Week is every year as well. Um, so, you know, we, we can't provide them all the time through some sort of uh, rebate, but I hope that you would go to that carpool savings calculator and be able to find out how much you're actually saving um, just on, on just by carpooling alone. Um, so this is a good question as well. So can you carpool with motorcycles? So this is actually, it's a funny question because um, Toronto with the carpool lanes, especially you might remember during Pan Am, uh, motorcycles were allowed in the HOV lanes. Um, so it sometimes is a little bit of a, a tricky point for people. If you have two people on your on your vehicle and you are uh, reducing someone else's trip, you're picking someone else up, meaning that they are not driving alone, that is carpooling. Again, dogs don't count, and I hope that they would have some kind of cute, you know, um, holder if they were on a motorcycle. Um, but if you are riding with someone else, that is carpooling, motorcycle pooling. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for that question, and I'm, I'm glad that we could kind of address the motorcycle issue because it can be a little bit tricky for people. Absolutely, yeah. So, so just to address a few key safety tips with carpooling. Um, so as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, and I'll just speak to it a little bit more. So meeting your carpool partner beforehand is a great way of, of getting to know them getting a sense of if you feel safe um, with them, and just getting getting to know uh, sort of what their preferences are and, and getting comfortable. So 
meeting them beforehand is important, as well letting people know that you are carpooling, whether it's your employer or someone at your home address, um, letting them know that you're sharing a ride with someone new. Oftentimes, uh, this is someone who uh, you know you might actually know because they might actually be at your workplace, so it might not be a stranger that you're carpooling with, which is great. So it's not necessarily that you sign up for the tool and they will always be um, strangers, but it's uh, it's important to to let people know that you're trying something new for for anything. Um, ah, yes. Yeah. So we have another question here: Is it does it count as carpooling if you're carpooling with a spouse? And so for the purposes of all of our contests and everything like that, of course, it's carpooling. You could be driving alone. You could be each driving separately. I know many, many couples who do that, um, even when they're going to the same place, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, so sharing the ride with your spouse is great. Um, and of course, as a Smart Commute employee, I always encourage people to uh, try carpooling with more than just your spouse. Why not pick up someone else as well? But that's just a Smart Commute employee talking. <laughs> um, but no, that's great, and it's important as well. Um, another key piece about safety, I just wanted to circle back for a moment. If you didn't want to necessarily meet someone at your house, um, maybe you just prefer to keep that private, um, or maybe you're just in introductory talks and you're, you're talking about what your carpool route might be, you are more than welcome to say, let's meet at the coffee time at the corner of this and that. You're more than welcome to say, we can meet at the carpool lot at this time and, you know, what's your vehicle make and that sort of thing. So things like that. You do not have to share your personal information with people even after you've connected and they seem like good carpool candidates. You are more than welcome to say, let's try this out for the first time from here to there and it does not have to be your home address. So that's a great point too. Um, and you can, you can try that out as well. Mm -hmm. Great. So our time is about up. So thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully we've learned some things about carpooling, car sharing, and autonomous vehicles. Um, and you know that the Smart Commute Month is a great time to try it. Uh, and Carpool Week and, and beyond is a wonderful time to be trying out um, this and continuing that behavior to save money and time and stress. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And um, we'll be sending out a short follow-up email with some, some supporting materials. Thanks so much for joining us. Again, my name's Adrian Boyd. Have a great afternoon.